It's actually a very short presentation of an inventory that I made for the Diocese of Skara uh, during 2014-2015. And uh, the Diocese of Skara actually is mainly what is uh, the landscape of Västergötland in southwestern Sweden. Uh, you have it in between of the lakes uh, Vernon and Vätten. And together with the other southern landscapes of Sweden, that's normally called Götaland. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, inventory uh, deals with the preserved medieval roof trusses. And what's quite interesting is then that in these uh, landscapes of southern Sweden, we have quite a lot of uh, preserved roof trusses from the 12th and 13th centuries still functioning and working since 800 years and sometimes a bit more, which seems to be quite unusual from an international perspective. So uh, that made this uh, survey quite important and actually several other surveys were made in different dioceses of uh, southern and middle Sweden during these years and uh, some are going on now so we are uh, getting quite a good view actually now of what is preserved. Uh, I will quite shortly just make some uh, presentation of uh, the earlier research. Actually uh, already in the beginning of the 20th century uh, research, uh, researchers, art historians like Erik Lundberg and Sigurd Kurman, who later became the head of the National Board of Antiquities, uh, noted the presence of quite well-preserved roof structures from what we call early medieval, that's actually then from uh, around uh, 1250 up till uh, beginning of the uh, uh, 14th century. So the chronology is a bit later in, in, in Scandinavia. And uh, it was already then, uh, early century, pointed out that this was a quite interesting field of research and uh, a good testimony they thought of domestic uh, carpentry on a very high level. But uh, actually no national survey was ever made uh, uh, in Sweden. And uh, I actually not until the 70s, 80s, with the development of dendrochronology, uh, a new interest uh, woke up for these preserved constructions. And uh, later in the 80s, 90s, a researcher, architect, also carpenter, Peter Schömer, brought a new perspective, uh, completing a bit the archaeological and art historic perspective uh, that was a common one before. So actually, uh, with uh, uh, experiments uh, by carpenters educated by the uh, Department of Conservation at the University of Gothenburg. One has uh, created a new kind of approach with uh, uh, interpretation, interpreting, uh, uh, reenacting, and after that, reinterpreting. And a good example of this is the reconstruction that's now being made of the burnt down timber church of Södra Roda from the, actually from the 14th century originally. originally. And uh, so that gave quite new eyes how to regard the processes that can be uh, noted and you can see the traces at the constructions of actually how they were created. And, uh, well, uh, an architect also from the Department of Conservation in Gothenburg, Kina Linskot, tried to make some kind of uh, uh, database of what we actually knew about preserved roof trusts in 2007. And then we got to know that we know very little. Uh, actually, what I already have said, maybe these kind of constructions in wood are some of the oldest wooden constructions still working, which is quite impressive. 
And they can tell quite a lot about the processes behind the erection of these medieval churches, the use and changes of the churches, and the techniques in use. And uh, well, until the 2010s, no overall service had actually been made, but now we are working on it quite, quite fast. So uh, the aim of my inventory was actually to pinpoint how many roof crosses from medieval times are more or less preserved uh, in the church ethics. And naturally, this was a kind of a, uh, inventory to get the data, to know how many do we have, in which state are they, uh, which kind of types. So uh, we can get a basis for the maintenance and preservation, because this is a quite delicate material and it can easily be tampered or destroyed we, if you have a roof restoration renovation and you don't know you have 11th, well, 12th century roof trusses or an electrician or insulation works and we just cover everything in insulation so that was the aims of these, uh, this work and uh, it became afterwards a quite heavy report, we could have a look afterwards, uh, like a catalogue. And uh, well, this is a kind of a summary on the map. Uh, the black ones are preserved medieval roof trusses, roof constructions. Uh, the red ones partly preserved and the white ones are just remains, like reduced parts in later constructions. And well, it's worth noting that I couldn't visit all the medieval churches of this diocese. Once upon a time it was 400, now it's 164 once. I visited 94 of these attics, and in around 70, almost 70 of these, you still find uh, standing constructions, uh, parts of them or traces of them. And 21 of these structures are actually well-preserved ones from the 12th and 13th centuries, still intact constructions. And uh, well, here, just like a kind of uh, introduction, if you are, are not familiar with the types of roof trusses, well, we have a quite simple and very simplified distinction between Romanesque and Gothic, which actually is maybe not that correct, because you can find Romanesque types up until the 17th, 18th century in Sweden, uh, as well as Gothic, but the main thing of Romanesque structure to the left is that you have a tie beam that is the big supporting part of the roof truss and you have the rafters and in between of the rafters you have different uh, versions of strut beams. Here you can see we have strut beams that at least in this case two of them cross each other and that's quite typical for this region. Uh, and uh, a colleague of mine, Carl Tallinn, has called these crossed strut beam roof trusses. And to the left, to the right, you have a classical Gothic one, where you have the later walls and so on that made the use of tie beam uh, impossible. So you had to find the raft, invent the rafter foot instead to spread the weight of the roof. Uh, were worth noting is also that the Romanesque roof truss is uh, most likely in most cases, at least in Scandinavia, uh, didn't have inner ceilings. They were completely open up until the ridge and often quite decorated. But how do you distinguish this is an early medieval one and this is not a 18th century cross strut beam roof truss? Uh, well, we have quite a good way, uh, apart from dendrochronology, and uh, that's the way the timber was worked. Uh, in Scandinavia, up until the, we could say, up until around the big plague in the 14th century, uh, we have a technique called sprethugning. Uh, there's no English name for it, but it's very characteristic, and uh, well, you cut away quite a lot of wood. It's very important to get the sharp angles and you cut alongside the fibers of the wood and with a special axe and in that way you get a quite 
is a recognizable um, uh, shape, which you can see in oblique lightning, like a fishbone pattern almost. Um, here you see one example on a high beam and quite, sometimes it's quite decorate, we think, but sometimes they have also uh, cut this away with a, 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 play, a knife to plane the surface or another axe cutting in a different angle to get an even smoother surface, which uh, what seems uh, today to have been the practice in the more continental parts of Europe, in Denmark and uh, Northern Germany, you don't seem to find this kind of uh, uh, working the wood. Uh, you could find out uh, kind of a chronology. Uh, we have a small, small group of churches mainly concentrated to uh, this small mountain at the side of uh, the Lake Vernon, which is called Chinecule. You have a group of, uh, yes, it's uh, five, six churches where you have uh, only two canted strut beams and they are joined with the rafters and the tie beams, not with overleafings or nails, uh, just with tenons, which you don't see in uh, the other ones. So it seems quite archaic, and uh, well, two of them we have uh, chronolo chronological data. For Jötuna, this church, we have the drawing, which is 1125, the wall plates of oak in the, in the chancel. Uh, only some of the roof crusts are intact, but uh, they are quite good recognizable, and actually this is a goes beyond a bit, but you have also the traces of an older building, a wooden building, which has left a mark in the gable from an old roof, probably a stave church around which the nave or the chancel later was built. Some other examples of these, uh, from these kinds of churches, uh, here it has been quite rebuilt, but you can still figure out the original position of several parts. Yes. You also find some decorate things uh, with the profiles around the tie beams, also indicating that these were originally visible constructions from beneath the church room. This is from Gotland, an example of the same type. And this is the most classical ones with the crossed strut beams. And as I said, the black ones are intact ones, mm. red ones uh, partly. And they span from 1130s until 1240s. And this is how they look. Uh, here have, we have the, the until now only known uh, carpenter signature of a man named Ulf Tutti, who probably then made parts at, of his church, Marum. This is also some eye candy. Um, this is uh, maybe the most complete one of them all because here you have preserved roof constructions from 12th, 13th century in all the parts of the church, even the tower, which is quite unusual nowadays. We have a decorate ridge purlin. And well, we have some quite nice from oak. Uh, the strut is missing. One other uh, roof. Uh, construction for tower. We have four of them, 13th century probably, not dated yet, but this kind of technique. And also mountings for liturgical bells, making this also part of the liturgical room. Uh, you know in the Catholic service the bell always marks different uh, parts of uh, the Mass, and you can find up till four different positions for this kind of bells in one church, in the nave and chancel. And also the wall plates could have been decorated on the outside, probably mainly just color, but uh, sometimes also carved, and the colors we can't see anymore. And this kind of uh, mixture of uh, 
Romanesque uh, art, Romanesque style, and uh, also a bit of the uh, old uh, animal ornamentation. So some traces are still there, been uh, rescued from renovations, fires, and here we have the Gothic ones, and they are quite few. And uh, well, Gothic are more common, so maybe it's a good end of it. Ah uh, yes, and well. It will be going on. These were just the empirical foundations, and now we have good opportunities to make further research. And well, if you're glad to have a look in the coffee break or something, I will place them here. Yeah.